Welcome everyone. Thank you for attending this panel on um, open source for energy systems and the impact that open source is having on the energy transition. I'm Dan Brown. I head communications at Linux Foundation Energy and we are very privileged to have a fantastic panel with us today. Um, I will run through some quick introductions and then we'll jump straight in so that we can get through all of my questions and hopefully get through to some of your questions as well. Um, so starting from my left, uh, Jonas van den Bogard is digital strategy lead at Aleander, the Dutch dis distribution system operator, which covers energy transport and distribution for a large part of the Netherlands. Uh, Jonas ensures that open source initiatives contribute to Aleander's digital strategy and objectives. He also is a leader in the Open Source Program Office and represents Aleander on Linux Foundation Energy's Technical Advisory Council. Next is Bryce Bartman, Chief Digital Technology Advisor at Shell. Um, Bryce focuses on how emerging dig digital technologies, data, and open source can contribute to Shell's digital strategy and provide solutions for the energy transition. He also uh, sits on the LF Energy Governing Board and Technical Advisory Committee and actively contributes to the real-time data ingestion platform project. Next is Hillary Carter, Senior VP of Research and Communications at the Linux Foundation, which means she's my boss. Uh, Hillary oversees the development of decision useful research projects and content programs that support open source as a paradigm for mass collaboration at scale. She started her career in financial services um, and has experience in corporate finance, research and analysis. Um, she eventually pivoted to digital technology and um, focused on, uh, initially focusing on mobile communications and digital media consulting. And before coming to the Linux Foundation, she led a global uh, research institute focused on blockchain. And last but not least is Christophe Villemer, general manager at Savoir Faire Linux, which is an open source integrator, developing solutions on open source methodologies and transforming them into economic and industrial levers. Christoph uh, is an engineer and entrepreneur. He's passionate about creating value through collaboration. At Savoir Faire, he uh, handles strategic partnerships and contributes to their growth of activities, including through Linux Foundation Energy and particularly the CPAP project um, in which Savoir Faire is a leader. So now that that's out of the way, let's get to the interesting part. Um, so I'm gonna start with a question for the whole panel. Um, and essentially, this is just to set the stage. So I would like all of you to tell me what you see as the biggest technological challenge being faced by the energy industry today. Should I start? Sure. Okay, well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, and thanks for introducing us. So um, I think the biggest technological uh, challenges that we're facing in the energy sector is the energy mix is changing. Um, but we are building it on infrastructure that's been around for a century. So how do we actually make that work um, and at the speed that we need it to? So um, I think that it, there's going to be technological challenges that Jonas is going to talk about around how a grid operator will make that work, how generation of energy works, how consumption of energy works, um, and then all of the technology that actually makes that all come together within a time frame that we needed to. So that, to me... <laughs> Woo, is uh, the biggest challenge that I think that we face technologically today. Thank you, Bryce. Jonas? I would like to add uh, that what you're already uh, mentioning is that the energy mix is, is changing. And that is a huge impact on the way we produce energy, distribute energy, and um, transport energy. And we already see in the Netherlands that we are closing down uh, fossil fuel power stations in order to reduce CO2 emissions. And we see a really strong increase in the number of solar panels, uh, the number of wind farms, uh, but also mobility is changing. Uh, we see uh, in, in the Netherlands specific an enormous uptake in electric cars. And that creates tremendous opportunities for a more cleaner and decarbonized world, but also uh, creates a tavern, uh, huge challenges for companies like Aliando. Christoph? Hi, everybody. For sure, the digitaliz digitization is one of the biggest challenges. It's a challenge for all the ecosystem, for vendors, for tech companies like us, for 
uh, also utilities for sure. Uh, it's a challenge because we need to go faster. We need, we need to speed the acce and accelerate for having new solution, new software, new system to decarbonize the energy sector. And uh, it's a big challenge for on that because we are moving from uh, you know legacy OT system to move forward to IT system. And actually, it's not only your tech uh, challenges. It's uh, human and organizational challenges for the company. So uh, it's, uh, it's a big challenge. Absolutely. Um, and Hillary? To follow on Christoph's thought, um, from my point of view, not really being at the forefront of technological uh, impediments, I see the challenges um, the great challenges being ones of regulation in two ways, within the, the energy sector itself, but also regulation in other industries like financial services, uh, as well as regulation like the CRA. Uh, where, where the energy sector is concerned, um, it's just simply an impediment to the proliferation of clean energy systems and prosumer energy um, initiatives. And there, there is we must work with regulators in tandem with um, technologists and organizations to help uh, move these initiatives forward. In terms of financial services, um, a lot of innovations that drive um, consumers to make appropriate uh, choices and incentivize um, the use of clean energy can be facilitated by innovative payment mechanisms that go peer to peer. And if governments are going to regulate um, these platforms, AKA blockchains and, and other types of digital asset infrastructures in a way that sets back that industry from, from being able to um, make advances, I, I see that as a, a problem. Agreed. Awesome. All right, so let's change gears a little bit. Um, Jonas, I'd like to go back to you. Um, particularly since you represent Aleander a utility. So from that electrical utility perspective, um, can you talk a little bit about why a distribution system operator like Aleander would get involved in open source in the first place? It's, you know, your industry typically has not been the most <laughs> uh, uh, open source friendly historically. Uh, also just mentioned uh, that the energy transitions pose its large challenges for companies like Alleander. Traditionally, the Netherlands, for example, uh, and even nowadays, has one of the most reliable energy grids in the world. However, we see that the grid that designed in the last decades is not designed for the rapid developments that are happening today. And we see that the demand for electricity is, is growing so fast, especially in the Netherlands, um, that we as Alleander have to say no to new business consumers that want to expand their businesses and on the need for electric power. Even though we as Aliend have significantly increased our investment in expanding the grid over the last few years. And this really requires us to look to new solutions. And especially here, digitalization plays an enabling, but also a fac facilitating role. And I really believe that digitalization cannot happen without open source software. So open source software really plays an important role in building new digital capabilities to better use the capacity that's currently available in our grid and make new solutions uh, like congestion management uh, possible. Interesting. Um, Christoph, similar question, but from a different uh, um, perspective. Um, so I'd like to hear from you why you think a multi-vendor approach such as that represented by open source um, is needed to address these challenges. You, of course, are coming from an IT services um, uh, uh, company. Um, so, you know, why wouldn't you be focused on selling proprietary solutions? Yeah, that's a complex question. But um, actually, the multi-vendor approach was a bit pushed forward by uh, the utilities like RTE, by example, the French TSO, also by uh, uh, Aliander. And it's good because it means that it's driven by the end user. But behind um, in, uh, multi vendor approach, I mean, it's more interoperability, what we're talking about. And that's um, exactly what uh, open source al allows you to do. It's uh, build uh, faster, create uh, cooperation, 
um, and and um, and allows you to 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 build partnerships and to develop uh, faster your, uh, your your solution and um, we need to to have that approach and actually that's exactly what we do at uh, at Sawafa Linux for more than uh, than 20 years I mean building open source software and uh, supporting them and uh, that's the particularity actually we see in the energy sector compared to other place where it's really as I said driven by the end user and this is a positive way because then I mean the ecosystem of the vendors which is traditional um, evolve then uh, because it's driven by the end users and we see now that there is an ecosystem which is emerging uh, and the traditional vendor like G by example um, is moving forward into th this kind of, uh, of solution and then we are here to, to, to gather uh, all, uh, all the team together. Fantastic. Um, Bryce, let's go to you. Um, from more of a generation perspective, obviously Shell does a lot of different types of power generation. Um, what prompted you to get involved in open source? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we all know that the energy uh, mix is changing. It's going to depend less on oil and gas and much more on electrification. Um, and Shell has investments and parts of its business are invested in that, that direction. So we have one of the largest um, mobile charging or EV charging networks in the world. Um, and that doesn't, you can't just deploy those as you like to. You have to work in collaboration with people like Aliander or companies like Aliander to make that happen. Um, and so Aliander and, and Shell actually work together in uh, what is called the Energy Transition Campus in Amsterdam, um, where we've naturally been talking about how do we solve some of the challenges in the Netherlands specifically. Um, but we're, we've also then, uh, and Jonas did a great job this morning talking about how you balance a grid when you have direct uh, electrification through uh, assets like wind farms and solar uh, farms. So um, we have those as well. Um, and again, it's another kind of point where we need to work together with the grid operators to make that all happen. So we were already talking to a, lot, not a number of the members. Um, you know, Shuli was, was so engaging in, in trying to paint out the picture of where we needed to go as a company as well. We wanted to do more. Um, because I think, you know, as we go forward, everyone is going to want to do things more openly, more transparently, um, and just make sure, I think there's a lot bigger interest in energy than there ever has been before. Um, and so we want to, you know, make sure that we can also provide solutions on, on how we run our business in that kind of construct. And then um, I think the, the thing that's important through all of that and where open source really stands out is with things like standards, interoperability, um, and those are going to be how we can talk to each other across our different businesses. So it makes a lot of sense. And then I think, you know, the bigger picture is that we've all got to get to uh, net zero by 2050 or earlier. Um, and I think open source and collaborations that LF Energy put companies like ours in really helps us to achieve that. I can say from a foundation perspective, and I hope you'll agree with me, Hillary, I love hearing that. You know, these examples of actual real world collaboration that are being driven through open source is exactly what we're here to talk about. Um, Music so, to our ears, Dan. Exactly, Music to our ears. Exactly. So I will turn to you, Hillary, and um, maybe you can kind of give that foundation perspective. I know that you've done a lot of research recently um, in this space and kind of tie together um, what these three have just commented on um, in terms of like why open source for energy. Yeah, thank you very much. I think what, what's very inspiring about what I have heard from my fellow panelists is um, their foray into a community like LF Energy and uh, understanding the link between open source and the energy sector and the role that we're helping to play in that equation through research is to provide the resource, um, the data um, that can encourage others to come along and join this journey. And uh, one of the very first conversations I had when I joined the Linux Foundation was in 2021. Um, I met with the various executive directors across the org and Shuli being one of them. And she was absolutely determined that we have a better understanding of the opportunity for open source and energy. And the best way we could create a picture of the landscape was through 
empirical research. And uh, we kicked off one of uh, two studies with the intention that um, uh, we could put a stake in the ground through reach research, uh, help others uh, join in um, the community and uh, decided that we, we ourselves at LF Energy and at Linux Foundation, we needed to have a better understanding about what the state of open source was in the energy sector worldwide, uh, particularly where it came to uh, the DSO and the TSO and how well uh, skilled uh, our survey respondents were in terms of, did they have the right technical skills to make the transitions necessary within the sector? So that was one study that we kicked off. And um, the second study was the, a qualitative report where we focused on, uh, with, thanks to Luchin Balea from RTE and Arian Stam from Oleander, uh, capturing the, the stories of these organizations, um, the, the DSO and the TSO, and why they made the decision to open source IP and collaborate in an open capacity uh, within and across the industry, and what was the value that was created? How did they overcome um, barriers within their own organization? How did they get to yes? And if Luchin can do it, and Aryan can do it, and, and others can do it, 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 those stories become inspiring and pave the way for others. In fact, the title of, of uh, that report is, the first part of the title is Paving the Way. Um, so that's how through research we are supporting uh, the various um, sector communities like LF Energy and um, I encourage everybody to, to discover the reports. Yes, those are all on our website, so please check them out if you haven't already. Um, but so following on what, you know, actually everyone said, but Hillary particularly there um, about how we're seeing this collaboration and how we're seeing these um, uh, uh, actual real world implementations, let's get into some specific examples. Um, so Jonas, I'll start with you. Um, give me an example of a real world example of a open source solution that Aliander is using and how it's benefiting you. I'm happy to. So we are involved in, in several projects, but I want to highlight one project in particular. So as Bryce was mentioning, uh, we were working together with uh, multiple organizations, Shell among, uh, among them, is to create new solutions that allow us to steer supply and demand in periods when the maximum grid capacity is reached. And this can be due to too much uh, production, for example, in a summer day where there's a lot of solar energy and wind energy, but little demand. Or in a winter period when there is a very cold day and uh, there's little sun or wind production at that moment. So we need a new capabilities uh, to make that possible. And one of the solutions which plays a key role at Aliander is OpenStep. And OpenStep is an open source project for uh, making forecasts for the load on the electricity grid for the next hours to days. And why is this important for us as Aliander? First, it's, it's really important to know when there's a risk that the maximum grid capacity is reached. And first, it's also important that we know this in, in, in time. So we have time to take action um, when there is a risk that a maximum can be reached. And OpenStep provides us that insight. And, uh, and that's a very, very helpful uh, project for us. And it's also really great uh, that by open sourcing this open source project, it enables us to, to uh, do co-creation with new parties, uh, sometimes with parties we didn't expect to collaborate with uh, when we started. But it's great that we found uh, a collaboration around OpenStep with RT, the French uh, TISO, which is also uh, collaborating in OpenStep and uh, currently replacing uh, their legacy uh, forecasting solution for a solution based on OpenStep. So it shows that open source can really help to bring together innovation budget and uh, increase time to market and spend uh, partly public money in a wiser and uh, more effective way. Awesome. Um, so Bryce, let's follow on that with you because I know Shell's also been involved in OpenStep as, um, as Jonas mentioned. Can you talk a little bit about that collaboration and, and feel free to bring up another project. Too. Yeah, I, no, that's a good one because yeah. I think um, 
when we joined LF Energy, uh, I had to do the presentation for bringing a new project into LF Energy, and the most supportive uh, <laughs> group was actually the OpenStaff group. They gave me feedback before that they were really excited about it, which was, which was, I guess, setting us off on the right direction from the very start. But at the heart of digitalization, I think if you look at anyone that's going to present a slide about it, is data. Um, it seems to be the, the integrator across everything. Um, and so we're, Shell contributed something called the real-time data ingestion platform, which is all about consuming real-time data into an for, uh, open source format that you, then you can query and, and use in your business. Um, and we had a closer look at OpenStaff um, because the reason why we built real-time data ingestion platform was to try and get, uh, enable more data science and AI capabilities within Shell. And OpenStaff by its nature is also machine learning based and analytics based. So um, we thought just naturally that the two worked together nicely. Um, and so we we're also talking on the governing body about how do we make LF Energy a more um, integrated set of capabilities instead of standalone products. So we started talking um, and then we decided that this was a great opportunity. So. Shell is now working really hard. I was trying to get it done by this presentation today. Um, I'm sure they're watching, but we're going to get this out very, very soon. The progress is amazing. Um, and we're going to show how you can run the real-time data ingestion platform and OpenStep together, which I think is really exciting. It will bring a whole new, I think, uh, set of capabilities to both products. Um, and I think we need to do that more. And so, you know, we're going to, just from today, learning a bit more about the other projects that are in LF Energy. There's more that we can do and talk to them and see what we can do. And I think we need to, again, that's part, the part of points of open source is just collaborate more. Exactly, and, and that's the value of the foundation model as well because it gives folks a venue to do exactly that collaboration. Um, thank you for that. Um, I wanna bring Christoph in. Um, could you weigh in uh, uh, with a project that Savoir Faire has been involved with that you are seeing having real impact on the industry? Yes, for sure. Well, then I will speak about the, as you said, the, the, the CPAS project. Uh, the CPAS project was actually launched in 2020 by, uh, pushed by Aliander and RTE and, uh, and us. So it's a brand new project, was, but already with a huge impact. So CPAS is at the art of the next generation of uh, the digitized substation. So CPAS is an acronym, like a lot of open source projects, which means software enable automation platform and artifact therein. But more specific, you know, it's a it, uh, reference design and uh, in it, it's an in industrial grade platform, real time platform that will host uh, automation production and control application from the vendors to manage the digitized substation. And this project actually got already an impact. It's, it, uh, it was already born in 2020, but then after three years of development, it's already a project which is at the early adoption stage of the Linux Foundation. And uh, it's a project, as I said earlier, that's it's really also driven by um, RTE on the end user. And this is the impact we see because very quick, it has allowed to emerge uh, a business and a market around the air. So RT will uh, have CPAS in production. Uh, it's not a secret, we can say it, Lucian. And uh, also what it makes that it drives, it motivated the, the vendors, traditional vendors, to use and to work on CPAS. And um, GE, GE here actually, GE Vernova in Bilbao, uh, they are here today, uh, also make a POC with CPAS. So we now have an ecosystem with end users, with vendor, and with um, technologies like us that's managed the open source project, that's our business model, um, to, to create quickly a real um, possible that make it uh, run the, the digital substation for quite quickly actually. And in uh, the last, um, in June, in the last LF Energy Summit, we actually launched the first uh, commercial offer on uh, supporting uh, CPAS to help the actors to uh, uh, customize for the training and, and for the support. So in a very short time, uh, we had a thanks to the cooperation of everybody, and that's really the, the power of the collaboration through the LF Energy. Uh, this project gets an impact very, very um, quickly in three years to get in the market. That's amazing. I mean, Hillary, I, I hope you'll agree with me that it's, it's just great to see 
the work that we're doing and the projects that we're hosting having real world impact and driving this energy transition forward. Um, can you sort of sum it up for us? Give us the, the high level, like based on what you've seen, the work being done at LF Energy, the research that you've done, um, what impact is open source having in a measurable way on the energy sector? Thank you, Dan. And again, music to my ears, music to our ears. Um, across the Linux Foundation, I mean, it's there's impact for the energy sector in numerous projects across the LF, not just LF Energy. And it's a spectrum of collaborative projects that are specific to open hardware, um, obviously open source software, open standards, open data. Uh, we know that energy efficiency is really important to Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, other uh, projects that uh, we've engaged in a research capacity were asking us to um, identify energy efficiencies. I'll give you one, two examples. Um, Intel uh, asked us to convene a roundtable to describe opportunities to uh, understand the energy consumption in blockchains and to um, help spread awareness that not all, all software is energy intensive. There are better energy choices, but we need to know what those choices are. And uh, you know, what's the, what is the, um, what are the structural differences and consensus mechanisms and how do they differ? Um, similarly, um, Within the Hyperledger Foundation, which focuses on, on uh, enterprise blockchains, we conducted a study on the uh, energy impact of non-fungible tokens. And not all are created equal. Um, and so these are the, the idea around efficient energy consumption is one that exists across most projects at Linux Foundation, from Green Software Foundation, it's important at OS Climate, uh, it's increasingly impo uh, uh, important uh, to the organization broadly. And it's nice to see initiatives where they're trying to reduce the overall um, uh, consumption and create more efficient hardware and more efficient software. Fantastic, all right, I do wanna leave some time for audience Q&A, we have 13 minutes left. So just one more short question from me, and this is for all the panelists. Um, if you had one ask for the open source community who are not currently involved in the energy sector on how they could help us and help the sector move forward more quickly, what would it be? So we'll just go down the line so you can start, Jonas. Yeah. So I think we showed and discussed a few great examples how uh, open source enabled code collaboration amongst multiple parties. And uh, I think this is just a start. Uh, I think there's a tremendous opportunity out there to, to find uh, new opportunities to collaborate, both within the sector, but also uh, today I would do especially ask to also outside the sector and see if innovations from other sectors like the finance sector, but also uh, the other sectors like Linux Foundation Edge, the developments in Linux Foundation IE and data can help also the challenges we have in the energy sector and see how we can leverage those innovations in those sectors to also help in the challenges we are facing in the energy sector. And I really want to add to that. I think energy is important to us all. Uh, we all, uh, benefit from a more cleaner, renewable, and decarbonized world. Great. Um, I was going to say something very similar. So I, I do think that um, there's so many amazing open source projects out there that have had great success. A lot of them in the Linux Foundation anyway, and I'm sure a lot of them are sitting in this building today. So what I would love to get from them is just their experiences, their knowledge, just teach us like we just like to learn a little bit more you know and I think we don't have to recreate something that seems to already exist and there is a formula to doing it so um, don't let the, the word energy mean that you don't think you should participate I think that you could be a great mentor to us and, and help us actually go in the direction we need to quicker uh, from my point of view I and I agree by the way with Jonas and, and uh, Bryce um, it's so important to show up, 
half half of half of the battle is won by just showing up and uh, volunteering and being present and uh, which was why I'll go back to the uh, one of the first reports we published um, sharing the story of Luchin and RTE's leadership and Arian and Oleander's leadership and this um, stage setting and storytelling and being able to identify real human beings who've gone on real journeys to make an impact within their organization and within their industry and inspire others. And so sometimes it's really hard to put yourself out there and take a career risk on um, collaborating with your competitors. Um, but trust that others have done it and we're here to help uh, if you need to make that transition. Um, uh, and so I raise my hand as tribute to help uh, engage any conversations as I know Dan and anybody on this panel would uh, help likewise. Let's talk. Yes, then I will, I will maybe return the question. <laughs> what the energy sector needs to do to keep an open source community active to help them, to help the sector. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, adoption of open source is the key. But uh, as I'm used to saying, you know, open source is not a free beer. So it needs investments, it needs uh, in, hum in human resources, uh, in money to uh, make the project uh, working and, um, and active. And it's really the strength of the LF energy that's to be, it's probably one of the, the lonely um, Linux Foundation, you know, part that is really driven by a sector which is not tech driven. And, and, and it needs to, we need to have more actors. You know, we, are, we have the, the pioneers, like I call them, uh, RTE, Aliander, which was at the beginning. It's good to, that shall join the club, but we need to have more, um, you know, legacy utilities from North America, from everywhere that come, that join, that invest to maintain the open source community active. And then they will have other company like us that will invest in return to keep the project alive. Awesome, I think that summed it up really well. Thank you for that. So we do have some time. Um, if there are any questions, we'd be happy to take them. Let me, let me borrow that. If you could speak into the microphone, please, for the people watching online. Okay, so this is a question for Christoph. So in the electrical industry, there are a few premises we can hold to be true. So one is we have a mission critical service. Uh, second premise, sometimes things go wrong. So maybe uh, Jonas has a blackout and that takes out power from Bryce's refinery. Okay, premise three, the utility needs to hold someone accountable. Okay, so the question is, uh, how do you do that with virtualization and open source? Who's accountable? That's uh, a very good question, Mike. And I, w I will have um, not a simple answers because when you have a project which is the, the, um, still in development and co-construct by the actors, we need to work all together to make it accountable. And there is also a new business model to, uh, to invent, you know. The traditional business model was quite easy. You had the utilities and you have you, G, all the vendors vending a device, sell, selling device and the accountability was easy. But now that we are moving from OT to IT solution, it complexify a lot the situation. And this is where the LF energy ecosystem is really important also to make, to leverage the ecosystem to make the piece of software we build together and that will be used to identify the accountability and to work with other projects. I mean, in CPAS, we use, for example, the Yocto project. So we work with the Yocto project for that. There is all the work doing about um, you know, software beef, bill of materials, SBOM, to try to make compliant the, the project. There is actually later a presentation of CIPAS on that part with this SBOM and all the, the this critical infrastructure piece of software that will be run. So 
to be honest, and we need to be honest, we don't have yet all the, the solution. We need to work together to identify your role, our role. This is the role also of, of Savoir Faire Linux, who is building a, uh, a commercial support on, on such a project. And there is also a reflection regarding such a vendor like G, but also your, your colleague from Schneider ABB that was used to sell device from hardware to software and to be accountable for everything. But now we have, you will sell software sometimes with another hardware and with the users. So we, this needs to review also, you know, the license contract, everything. And it's also our, our role in maintaining the project to make sure that all the licensing is very clear, that we could identify the vulnerabilities to organize the way to solve them and that it's completely um, transparent for uh, the risk assessment for the seller, the users and the integrators. Any other questions? Well, so far, a lot of these solutions seem to revolve around electric energy. I know now in, in this panel, uh, gas and um, I, I don't know, uh, maybe even oil, like other energy commodities, uh, hydrogen also, are represented. How do you see that develop uh, uh, within LF Energy going forward? I'll start with that. Yeah, so we're a business of molecules, uh, not electrons, essentially. So uh, for us, I think a lot of people, when we came into LF Energy, I think the word energy should represent molecules as well as electrons. Um, and I think that a lot of the projects, because of where they've come from, are in that direction. But we are seeing, like, uh, in the, 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 what we've contributed and then where we're seeing the integrations, we're seeing a lot of opportunities for being able to take what is already there and starting to deploy it into, into something like oil and gas. So um, I think there needs to be more. I'd love to not be the only oil and gas major st sitting here talking about it. I think if we could get more uh, people joining and, and participating, then we would probably have a little bit more representation in the code base as well. Um, but I do think that the, you know, because the direction of travel in the energy sector right now is more towards electrification and, and what that future looks like, you'll see businesses like ours trying to do more and more of that. So we'll probably be adopting that. And, and we are, I mean, the, you know, where we think about wind farms and solar farms and EV charging, those are all kind of ex uh, perfect examples of where we could deploy LF Energy today. Right, we have time for another question, if there is one. All the way in the back. No, you're fine. <laughs> so in a prior session, there was discussion about uh, cross collaboration between projects, and I would love to hear your thoughts around securing critical infrastructure. You know, we're represented here by, a, you know, critical, uh, we, we see what happened with the, the pipeline under the sea and curious, you know, if you're, especially with uh, attacks, not just physical attacks, but but uh, attacks on, on our infrastructure and some thoughts, maybe LF Energy could be working with ELISA, this uh, secured infrastructure there. So that's a, so that's a really good question. Uh, so security, especially in the energy sector, is very important uh, because we are talking about mission-critical environments. And um, we are happy uh, that there's a lot of experience in the Linux Foundation and especially in the Open uh, Security Foundation that we can leverage also in LF Energy. And one of the things uh, we have been working on in the LF Energy Technical Advisory Committee is that we are helping uh, the LF Energy projects to take advantage of those new tools and best practices uh, to also adopt in the energy specific projects. A good example is the OpenSF um, batch, which uh, helps projects to identify where uh, they have, which practices they have in place and where there's an opportunity to improve. And we uh, really make that mandatory to grow in the life cycle of of LF energy projects to get a certain level on that batch. Yeah, and I, I also part of the technical advisory committee, we were talking about this in a meeting in Paris um, 
I think given the security challenges we have uh, in Europe in particular, we know how vulnerable we can be if there are problems. Um, and so one of the things we've seen is also by putting out your solution into the open and having others scrutinize it has already, like the contributions we're making as a company are far better than we've ever made before that we probably would have been running on infrastructure that we own anyway. So by doing that just by its nature should should help. But I, we want to do much more in this space because we also, I think, are going to be exposed to some challenges maybe with, you know, intelligent organizations that really want to attack uh, technology that maybe LF, that has been deployed by LF Energy. So we were doing a lot of work to understand what that really means and then how do we educate the contributors, the, the p p projects working on LF Energy to improve their security around their products. Yes, if, if I can add too, I mean, it's really the strengths of uh, uh, the Gilkey system of the uh, Linux Foundation is leverage with all the projects the knowledge to to make the the, the project the best to uh, to attempt the the goal um, and also maybe a way to review the way we build projects i mean for on cpath because it was uh, or to build project with a really cyber uh, awareness from uh, the start and uh, for the cpath project because the first use case would have would be the the france the project has, has been um, really developed with uh, the mapping of some of the recommendation of the French uh, national and cyber uh, agency. And uh, we had a uh, DevOps approach to, uh, through test to uh, show, and this on GitHub you can see uh, the 700 tests running and all the red, fr the green flag, <laughs> <laughs> which maps all the requirements from the, the, the French National Cyber Agency. And this approach can be actually mapped up to another uh, uh, agency from another country. So it's a way to develop the fact to get the transparency on the way that the project is secure on that way. But we know that cybersecurity now is, it's not a question of uh, I won't be attacked, it's I will be attacked anyway, so it's building resilient uh, software to make sure that you're able to react quickly. All right, thank you all so much. Really appreciate it, panel. We are out of time, but um, if you have more questions, please track these folks down, and thank you all for being here.